last evening, the moon rose above this rock, impure upon a world unpurged. The man and his companion stopped to rest. You are listening to the voice of Wallace Stevens reading his poem, How to Live, What to Do. A page from this Sunday's edition of Anthology. I, Sobolov, whose second book of poems, Dinosaurs and Violins, has just been published by Farrah, Strauss, and Young, Conrad Aiken writes in the foreword, In my opinion, this is a remarkable book. If it is primarily a poetry for the eye and the mind, and basically metaphysical, as perhaps the best poetry should be, nevertheless, Mr. Sobolov manages this so neatly and easily translates his abstractions so naturally and vividly into urban, quotidian, homely, and even humorous terms as to produce the effect of the quietest lyric immediacy, on the one hand, and something like metropolitan folk on the other. Then follows a description of some of the verse which we shall hear in just a few moments from the poet himself. And Mr. Aiken concludes his foreword, Mr. Sobolov has one of the best things a poet can have the gift of seeing the ordinary as if it had never been looked at before. Hi, before we ask for an illustration of Mr. Aiken's statements, we'd like to talk to you. Well, more as Mr. Sobolov, American businessman. How do you happen to be businessman and poet? That's a pretty sweeping question, I guess, to ask you in one uh, blow, so to speak, isn't it? I think they both involve imagination and... uh... And need, and primarily for me, I suppose, it involves need and the need for approval. It, it's a way of not so much therapy as of being a part of nature and finding a spiritual objective completed. You don't find it all at all strange, in other words, to jump from the one to the other. How do you actually, uh, when the time comes for you to write a poem for instance. Uh, You get up, say, at 8 o'clock in the morning and you're at business at 9, whatever. When do you write the poems? I write a poem when I can, and and that means wherever I am. Uh, It isn't a question of stopping at one point with your business or beginning at the other with, with your poetry or my poetry. I think it's taking advantage of time. You mean you just sit down, um, supposing you suddenly have five minutes between telephone calls, you have to sit there and wait for a telephone call from Detroit, so you say, I'll write a poem? So is it, no, is it, it's uh, not is as it bland a control as that. Thing, or does it's it... not as bland as that. It's an accumulative thing that suddenly uh, uh, exhibits itself in, in uh, the need I'm talking about to not to be alone, to, to be a part of where you are, and not to gripe too much. <laughs> well, in other words, you don't find that the the stringent requirements of business, which are, I would uh, think could be soul-shattering very often to a poet. You don't find that these uh, burst in upon your inner self and uh, make it more difficult for you to get back to your poetry. No, on the contrary. I think that the frustration in each uh, expression is, is just as difficult for me, anyhow. As I mentioned to you before we went on the air, hi... Uh, You talk more like a poet than like a businessman. I can't imagine you in the uh, situation where you would have to be hard-headed and, uh, you know, uh, unscrupulous with your competitor, shall we say. Well, I think competition doesn't exist just in business. I think competition begins among two people in in anything they do. The incident of, of a taxi and two people running in their excitement, whatever the reasons are, in their haste, probably, to take over the same taxi. And by the way, this story was told to me by a taxi driver the other day. He said, I don't know what to do about it. There I was, and two women came to get the same taxi. And they fought with each other and insulted each other, and it was just embarrassing. I said, what did you do? He said, well, I said to the one of the women, I think that one of you ought to make it be mine because I have to make a living. And then the older woman was very sweet and said, well, I guess you need the taxi more than I do. Now, that woman there, in an ordinary day experience, Not in the marketplace so much as in the actual competition of of life itself and ordinary things, if you like. Someone had to be gentler than the other. But the gentler one lost the taxi. That's my point. I know that, but somehow uh, she may have stronger limbs in the end. I'm not being (laughs) facetious, but uh, 
you can't. I don't think the other example is the, is, the, is the way to accomplish it either. I'm also I'm trying to say that the same thing exists, exists in business. Yeah, I thought that was your question. Yes, you? yes, well, exactly. The business is no different than the, and that same person, either woman going into business would bring with her that same personality and the same values. So business is not extraneous or any different than what people are. That was by the same token, she'd lose the business, wouldn't she? Well, I know some very refreshing people in business who don't lose their businesses, and they're very decent and very courageous and, and very gentle. Gentleness, I think, is misunderstood too much by too many of us. Too many people think that gentleness is weakness. It's not at all. Just because you don't want to do certain things doesn't mean to say you're not, you're not aware of them and don't, don't understand them. You told us a little story which I thought was quite charming before we went on the air. I, I was sort of hoping I could lure you into it now, and you seem to be holding back. And that's the one about Sam Jones. I think uh, people would like to hear that because, aside from illustrating a point, it's very charming. Well, that's exactly the kind of thing I mean. That, that business is not a, a, a gagger into and thing. It's not a. It's nothing more than people. And uh, some years ago, I was visiting in Puerto Rico on a matter, and, and I went over to the Virgin Islands for a couple of days, and I was walking on the beach, and I saw a little boy, and he was contemplating a a uh, lovely lizard that I was contemplating, and I just loved this lizard. I became quite attached to him in a fantasy way, and this little boy had a toy boat, metal boat, and was just about to conk the dear little lizard over the head, and I said, now, gee, don't you do that, and I think I sort of rescued the lizard, and I hope I rescued this boy, primarily, and uh, I said to him, now, don't you do that, this is a friend of mine, and he looked at me suspiciously and said, well, what are you talking about? This is a lizard. I said, yes, this is a lizard, son, not a snake. And uh, I know his brother very well, and I went to school with him, and I just won't let you do that. He didn't hurt you, and he was a little confused, a little bewildered, and, and not too trusting of me at, at that moment. But we talked for a while, and I finally think I convinced him that this was not a snake. This was a lizard. And lizards were gentle creatures and should be helped across the sand and not destroyed. Well, he became very lonely then for the lizard and wanted to know where he couldn't find Sam Jones because I told him his name was Sam Jones and I knew his brother Johnny Jones very well. And he said, well, I'll tell you. I will not kill that lizard. I will talk to him and I will do the best I can. This was after controversy and we negotiated this thing for a while. And I promised in return that I would call the airport at Puerto Rico, San Juan, and get his brother to send Sam Jones back. And I guess God was with me because at that very moment, Sam Jones appeared on a, on a, near, the, a, near, near a tree on the sand. And I called him over and picked him up and we discussed it. And this child was convinced that this was not a snake, but just a little lizard. Have you ever thought of putting that down in poetry, hi? Well, I'd like to. I think it would be an excellent subject. Don't it's you? a story, I think, yeah, more than it is a narrative yeah. poem. But I think primarily yeah. it would be better in prose. Oh, you well, perhaps. But I'm yeah. sure even if you wrote it in prose, it would probably be poetic, wouldn't it? Well, I think the feeling would be. I hope it would, because I think it's a true, gentle, lovely story. I was asking you before about how and when you write and so on, and I know that you brought some notes along with you that you scratched down just a day or two ago to illustrate to me and to everybody else uh, the sort of poetry that uh, you do write during the course of the day. And this, so to speak, is your latest effort. Your love has lived in you long, longer than your sorrow. Your love is hiding in a periwinkle shell. Your love lives of your fingering. Sleep the blurry, enough the terrain. Bring back your love unhurt. Your love is of your fingering, and the dance inside your shoes. Choose the sun, the sun again. Enough the shade. Tell me how I can open back my love. Back from the periwinkle shell. Tell me how to wipe my sorrow's leaf and dance outside my shoes. I'll tell you how, my dear. Put your fingers on my face or close your eyes until I tell you, not too loud, in whispers of a kiss. I'll tell you how to bring your love from hiding. I'll tell you now. I'll tell you now. And now let's hear some of your works from your latest book. This is the second edition of poems by High Sobolov called Dinosaurs and Violins. <clears throat> History book. 
Who was born today, and who lived? Who gathered all these places left behind? Mapped out America with crayon and a wig. Red for arterial tracks, green for grass, a tree on a hill for a flag. Here we unloaded freedom from a boat, in this land of higher skies and warmer hearts. In this street, no queen threw stones for bread, nor corrupted the air with moldy fans. Our trees are their history streets. Our trees, their hanging heads. In new forests, coyotes shout our anthem. Birds gather the skies, bring their stars to America. Oh, my country, the world has trickled her mistakes into your bosom. These are your stripes and your glory. The next poem is Flight Back. When I began the flight back, I lamented the end of the day. I left the grass behind me and climbed into the sky. Through the dusk, I could see a torchlight from the aerial tower. The moon, quartered by the month, made a basket for our shadow. The plane whipped the wind. Seen through the cockpit window, the nightscape pooled my feelings. A fantasy of staccato bells began the electric symphony that stretched from the country to the city. The town lights blinked. The fields hummed brisk undertones. We were in the wilderness, between darkness and darkness. Every sound was our own. It was a miracle of feeling, not to look down, but to hang in the air, to disappear into distance. Suddenly, the sensation of overcoming wild blindness, of lights shrieking a landslide, then infant sighs of movement below, twisted my breath. The pilots prepared for our leap to the ground, and wind fought the hungry propellers as I tied my feelings to the street again. I ran from the field, from the alerted plains. The catastrophes of size had betrayed me. I ran from the cement field and oriented myself to the meadow. The next poem is Abstract Painting. An abstract painting wires my feelings. Its humps of dark colors drain into proper shapes. The order and abstraction, clearer than a face, makes a straight line. Yet each arterial wire connects like a spring to help walking, help thinking, control jumping. The abstraction is a factory humming with machines, making for perfect color and perfect size. Through round eyes, square things live, like a man's body, involved with hands shorter than his legs. The size of things is under his skin, where each pinch squeezes a response, makes motive, and bleeds its tickle. My next poem is I Search the Silence. I search the silence for old sounds, for frost and hard sorrows. I condensed my triumph with a drink, thought of curses that sharpened men's teeth, of their swiftness and their unease, their half-masted flags. I relived the seasons of my life, saw the mockery that blocked my way, like the wind on a thin day that ceases suddenly. Life was scarce and breathed without me, sucked my greed into a trap, made me forget my kinsmen. I saw the secret of my falling days, how grief had paralyzed my freedom and chased my loves undercover. Thank you very much, High Sobolov, poet and businessman, whose latest edition is called Dinosaurs and Violins and has just been published by Farrar, Strauss, and Young. Thanks very much for being with us on Anthology. Thank you, sir. On 
Tuesday evening at the Commodore Hotel in New York, the sixth annual National Book Awards for Outstanding Works by American Authors were presented to William Faulkner for his novel, A Fable, to Joseph Wood Crooch for his book, The Measure of Man, and to Wallace Stevens for the collected poems of Wallace Stevens. A special citation was awarded to E.E. E. Cummings for his poems, 1923 to 1954. Wallace Stevens, this year's winner, was born in Reading, Pennsylvania. He attended Harvard Law School and then studied at New York Law School, receiving his degree in 1903. In 1904, he was admitted to the New York Bar and began practice in New York City. Since 1916, he has been associated with the Hartford Accident and Indemnity Company, of which he became vice president in 1934. Although Mr. Stevens had contributed to the Harvard Advocate, he did not gain general recognition as a poet until Harriet Monroe included four of his poems in a special war issue of Poetry, a magazine for verse, in 1914. Among his books of poetry which have been published are such familiar titles as Harmonium, The Man with the Blue Guitar, The Auroras of Autumn, and of course the collected poems of Wallace Stevens, which was published by Alfred A. Knopf, Incorporated, in 1954, and won this year's National Book Award for the Poet. Since Mr. Stevens could not be with us this week, he very graciously made arrangements with Harvard University to allow us to play selections from his works, which he recorded recently for the university. We are grateful to Mr. Stevens and to Harvard for their generosity. And now, here is Wallace Stevens. The Dwarf. Now, it is September, and the web is woven. The web is woven, and you have to wear it. The winter is made, and you have to bear it. The winter web. The winter woven, wind and wind. For all the thoughts of summer that go with it in the mind, pupa of straw, moppet of rags, it is the mind that is woven, the mind that was jerked and tufted in straggling thunder and shattered sun. It is all that you are, the final dwarf of you that is woven and woven and waiting to be worn, neither as mask nor as garment, but as a beam torn from insipid summer, a mirror of cold, sitting beside your lamp, there, citron to nibble, and coffee dribble, frost is in the stubble. Last evening, the moon rose above this rock, impure, upon a world unpurged. The man and his companion stopped to rest before the heroic height. Coldly the wind fell upon them in many majesties of sound. They that had left the flame-freaked sun to seek a sun of fuller fire Instead, there was this tufted rock, massively rising, high and bare beyond all trees, the ridges thrown like giant arms among the clouds. There was neither voice nor crested image, no chorister, nor priest. There was only the great height of the rock and the two of them standing still.
to rest. There was the cold wind and the sound it made. Away from the muck of the land that they had left. Heroic sound, joyous and jubilant and sure. Poem that took the place of a mountain. There it was, word for word, the poem that took the place of a mountain. He breathed its oxygen, even when the book lay turned in the dust of his table. It reminded him how he had needed the place to go in his own direction. How he had recomposed the pines, shifted the rocks, and picked his way among clouds for the outlook it would be right where he would be complete in an unexplained completion. The exact rock where his inexactness is would discover at last the view toward which they had edged where he could lie and gazing down at the sea, recognize his unique and solitary home. To the one of fictive music, sister and mother and diviner love, and of the sisterhood of the living dead, most near, most clear, <clears throat> and of the clearest bloom, and of the fragrant mothers, the most dear and queen, and of diviner love, the day, and flame, and summer, and sweet fire, no thread of cloudy silver sprinkles in your gown its venom of renown. And on your head, no crown is simpler than the simple hair. Thou, of the music summoned by the birth that separates us from the wind and sea, yet leaves us in them until earth becomes by being so much of the things we are gross effigy and simulacrum none gives motion to perfection more serene than yours out of our imperfections wrought most rare or ever of more kindred air in the laborious weaving that you wear. For so retentive of themselves are men, that music is intensest, which proclaims the near, the clear, and vaunts the clearest bloom. And of all vigils musing the obscure, that apprehends the most which sees and names as in your name an image that is sure among the iron spices of the sun O oh, bough and bush and scented vine in whom we give ourselves our likest issuance yet not too like yet not so like 
to be too near, too clear, saving a little to endow, half feigning with the strange, unlike, whence springs the difference that heavenly pity brings. For this, musician, in your girdle fixed, there other perfumes. On your pale head, where a band entwining, set with fatal stones, unreal, give back to us what once you gave. The imagination that we spurned and crave. Wallace Stevens, reading The Dwarf, How to Live, What to Do, The Poem That Took the Place of a Mountain, and To the One of Fictive Music, selections from his poetic works. May we again express our appreciation to Mr. Stevens and to Harvard University for allowing us to play these special recordings this week on Anthology. Next week on Anthology, David Allen will talk to us about his new album, No Single Thing Abides, and play some of his favorite selections. And as our second guest, Tennessee Williams, reading his own poetry on the Cadman album, Tennessee Williams, Selections from His Writings. In behalf of the entire staff of Anthology, we'd like to extend our congratulations to John Malcolm Brennan, director of the Poetry Center of the YM and YWHA who last week received a gold medal for distinguished service to poetry from the Poetry Society of America. At the Poetry Center on February 2nd at 8.40, Arthur Miller, the playwright, will read from his works with commentary, and on Sunday, February 13th, W.H. Auden and the New York Pro Musica Antiqua will present an evening of Tudor and Elizabethan poetry, set to music by Bird, Wilby, and others. Anthology is produced by Steve White, Written and directed for WRCA by Draper Lewis. And this is your host, Fleetwood.